Okay, welcome. Uh, greetings to everyone and thank you for joining us today. I know there are several fantastic programs that are in the same time slot, so I really appreciate all of you choosing to join this panel on gun violence and human rights. My name is Madeline George. I am the Senior Fellow at the Whitney R. Harris Law Institute at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. I run the Institute's Gun Violence and Human Rights Initiative, along with one of today's fantastic panelists, Professor Layla Sadat. However, before I get to today's panelists, I want to set the stage for our discussion. Although this panel does have a particular focus on the situation in the United States, firearms and gun violence are not unique to this country, although, as we will discuss, we certainly do hold a unique position. Globally, there are 1 billion firearms. 857 million of these, or 85%, are in civilian hands. In contrast, 13% are in military arsenals, and the final 2% are owned by law enforcement agencies. Yet firearms lead to devastating consequences for human rights. As many of our international bodies have noticed. I'm getting a note that my sound is garbled. Um, all right. Um, I think it's important here to point out that 46% of global homicides are committed with a firearm at a scale of 174,000 a year. In Latin America and the Caribbean, which have the world's highest homicide rates, this is even higher, with 66 to 72% of homicides involving firearms. Yet while other countries do suffer from gun violence, the U.S. is a global outlier. Nearly 40,000 million, 30,000 people are killed by guns in the United States. Two thirds of these deaths are suicides, presenting a really unique challenge. Another 175,000 people are non fatally wounded by firearms each year. Research shows us that just the presence of the gun in the home increases the risk of homicide, suicide, and accidental shooting. And this is a real problem, as in the United States, we have an estimated ratio of 120 guns to every 100 people. We own 46% of the world's civilian owned firearms and yet compromise only 4.3% of the global population. Per 100,000 people in the US, we have, uh, per 100,000 people, the US has nearly 12 times as many gun deaths as Australia, eight times as many as Israel, and nearly 20 times as many as Spain. Perhaps unsurprisingly, those countries have comprehensive systems regulating firearm ownership and sales. In contrast, See if this helps. In contrast, a review of US federal regulations related to firearms and their oversights reveals a consistent threat trend of loosening regulations and restrictions. The last major piece of federal gun control legislation in the US was adopted more than two decades ago. This gun violence crisis touches every corner of society and it seemingly leaves no group untouched. It affects our school children, targets religious communities, and those attending political and civil rights rallies finds us at cultural events like concerts, disproportionately affects our country's youth, populations of color, and women. This violence creates negative psychological stress, has fostered a general climate of fear that interferes with the enjoyment of fundamental human rights every day. And yet, our gun laws and violence are not just affecting communities across the United States. Instead, we are exporting firearms and gun violence across our borders, especially to Central and South America. This, of course, has ripple effects back to the US, such as those relating to migration, economics, and gun trafficking. We must pay attention to this legal reality. Today, I am honored to be joined by three really fantastic panelists who can shed some light on this phenomenon. We will begin our discussion by looking globally and then move the lens inwards from a more domestic perspective. First, we will hear from Professor Barbara Frey. She is the senior lecturer at the Institute for Global Studies the Human Rights Program at the University of Minnesota. From 2000 to 2003, Professor Frey served as an alternate member on the UN Subcommission for the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. She was appointed Special Rapporteur of the Subcommission from 2003 to 2006 to conduct a study on the topic of preventing human rights abuses committed with small arms and light weapons. Today, she will discuss her work on this issue at the United Nations and explore the recommendations made by UN bodies to reduce the human rights violations caused by firearms. Next up, we will hear from Eugenia Vargas. She is the Associate Director of Gun Violence Prevention at the Center for American Progress. Research has 
focus on preventing arms trafficking and gun violence in the United States and Mexico. On a personal note, I am honored to have presented alongside Eugenia before a hearing on this topic at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Today, he will talk about how U.S. guns end up in international markets, which will be further focus on Mexico. He will also discuss the human rights abuses perpetrated there and suggest some ways that this can be limited. Finally, Professor Leila Sadat will bring the focus to, to the United States. She will explore how the U.S. failure to effectively regulate firearms and the resulting high levels of gun violence violates the U.S. government's international human rights obligations. She will also open up the discussion on how international law can help us address this crisis, as well as address some of the barriers we face in doing so. Professor Sadat is the James Carr Professor of International Law and Director of the Whitney R. Harris Law Institute. He founded the Institute's Gun Violence and Human Rights Initiative in 2017 in the wake of the Las Vegas massacre. In addition to being my wonderful boss, he is also the president of Abila. Please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to talk to your fellow attendees. I believe if you open the chat box on your Zoom screen, there's a button that says to all panelists. You can switch this to say to all panelists and all attendees. I also welcome you to submit your questions for all of our panelists using the Q&A function. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Frey. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. And uh, I'd like to extend a thank you to the Harris Institute at the Washington University School of Law for putting together this, this panel. Um, this continues to be an important issue in the United States as well as around the world and one that should be addressed by international law more frequently. So my role, see if I can share my screen. Uh, my role here is to discuss uh, the framework of international human rights law and how it relates to the issue of gun violence. And particularly today, we're going to talk about uh, gun violence between civilians and the role of uh, civilian acquisition and possession in, um, in international law. So what does the human rights framework offer to this discussion? Well, um, first of all, it's, um, uh, it reframes the individual human rights narrative and specifically reframes it um, toward the victim, thinking about the role of guns on um, victims, both individually and collectively, and away from just a single conversation about uh, uh, self-defense and the rights of the gun bearer. Um, international human rights law also helps us to examine gun violence in a global context. And what that means is, um, is looking at, at these issues comparatively, both to learn um, practices that work or problems that we have in common, um, and also examining the effects of the easy availability of, uh, of weapons and guns in weaker states, uh, which is a, a serious problem. What rights are affected by civilian acquisition and misuse of guns? Um, well, of course, the entire spectrum of human rights. Most of the literature at this point focuses on the right to life because we think about the role of guns in um, extrajudicial killings and, um, uh, and taking away people's life. But when you examine it, and uh, the United Nations has, has done this examination, uh, it it's also deeply affects the right to thought, conscience, and religion, a non-derogable right in international law. Um, when we look at selective attacks upon religious groups, um, the attack upon the Muslim uh, community in Christchurch, New Zealand, as an example, and um, other threats of violence and, uh, and killings in religious communities. Um, in our country, we're looking right now at the right to vote and the, the impacts of um, gun possession on that right and people's, uh, the, the chilling effect it's having uh, people's fear about people showing up to the poll, polling places with guns. 
In other countries, this has had a very real impact. In Mexico's 2018 elections, there were 21 candidates who were killed with firearms um, uh, during or after that election. So um, this can have real impacts on the democratic process. And then of course, economic, social and cultural rights as well are impacted. Most obviously health systems are deeply impacted by dealing with gunshot injuries and long-term disability issues. Um, and these can impact the priorities of a system. And um, uh, if emergency rooms are dealing with, uh, with, um, with gun violence um, in this moment, it decreases their capacity to address other issues. Uh, the right to education is another important um, right that is affected by gun violence. In Rio de Janeiro, in 2017, shootouts between rival gangs and or police uh, forced closure of 20 to 30 schools per day. And so we know in, in communities that are saturated with gun violence that there can be a collapse of economic activity and cultural activity. So what has the UN done about this, this issue, in particular, the issue of civilian possession? Well, first of all, um, I wanna point out a curious separation in the United States between the um, uh, gun discussions and the arms discussions that take place in New York in the first committee of the General Assembly um, on security and um, the discussions that are at least now beginning to take place in the office through the office of the high commissioner for human rights in and the mechanisms in geneva that address human rights issues uh, prior to 2001 there had been absolutely no discussion of um, of gun violence and human rights in the human rights context these are the chimneys we're familiar with in the um, in the UN context, and there was a, a deafening silence um, in the human rights side of the, of the system. But in 2001, there was an important conference that was held, the UN Conference on the Illicit Trade in Small Arms and Light Weapons, which resulted in a, um, an important political program of action. Um, and during that time, um, uh, I uh, was a member of the UN Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. I was an alternate member and I um, asked and received a study um, to uh, look at the question of, of this intersection of small arms and human rights. So in 2002, the commission, subcommission um, uh, nom uh, selected me to do a working paper paper and in the following four years, um, uh, I carried out a study on the prevention of human rights violations committed with small arms and light weapons. The idea was to understand the human rights implications of these issues and not just the security, domestic national security implications. So in my, um, uh, uh, in, the resolution that named me a uh, special rapporteur, the subcommission said, the protection of human rights must be central to the development of further principles and norms in this area. So the key findings of my study during that time are these four. First of all, a need to address the weapons themselves. Uh, second, um, that the impacts of gun violence are across the full spectrum of human rights. Third, the need for a machinery of control to prevent violations, especially of core rights. And fourth, that there is no freestanding right of self-defense that should support and legitimize private possession of guns. So let me address each of those briefly. Um, the gun itself, and here I have this asterisk as a mathematical representation of the multiplier effect of the gun on human rights issues, because we know a single weapon um, can change the fate, not just of the, an individual, but family and community. And this picture is um, to remind us that, that we would not be intimidated by this young man, a young man, small boy, 
uh, in any other context, but the fact that um, he's holding a weapon and th that gives him an inordinate and um, undue amount of uh, power and fear. Um, the flood of, of small arms can shift in an, the entire balance of a community, leading to uh, the lack of uh, personal security that destroys the rule of law in communities. And we've seen this all too often. The second finding of the full spectrum of rights being violated, as I mentioned before, and this has been elaborated now in several UN reports, is that we're affecting the entire range of human rights violations from uh, sexual assault um, to uh, forced displacement to the uh, lack of uh, education in communities. The third uh, finding is that um, an obligation through the, the uh, law of due diligence that uh, states are obligated to establish a machinery of control and it, it, to regulate the impacts of, of small arms and light weapons, particularly to keep guns out of the hands of those most likely to misuse them. So we're not talking about banning uh, private possession of handguns. We're talking about keeping them out of dangerous hands. This was based on a, a survey that was part of my study where we received responses from 41 states, um, which is relatively high level for um, uh, human rights surveys of that era. And the findings were that of those, um, of those reporting, 100% of those states required licensing, screening, and or background investigations um, for seeking licenses. 100% of those responding states vetted applicants uh, on the basis of age and criminal record, 84% required consideration of psychological profile, and 73% examined record of domestic violence. And this was in you know, 2003, right? So it's 17 years ago. 29 of the 35 states who reported on this question um, uh, limited the type and quantity of weapons that individuals can hold. And all states maintained a database of licensed small ownership. So uh, based on these findings, um, uh, I, uh, we, we can say that there's a need for a machinery of control. So the other um, uh, analysis that was part of the study, especially regarding civilian possession, was the question of whether or not there is a human right to bear arms. Um, this, is a, um, uh, this is an assertion by some of the pro-gun uh, pro-gun lobby community that there is somehow a fundamental human right to bear arms. And, you know, we think of it in the United States as a, as a desire to export the Second Amendment globally. Um, and so under international law, um, I analyzed this principle. And, and while the principle of self-defense is has a unanimous, a universal and important place in international human rights law, it does not provide an independent legal supervening um, right to arms possession. Um, this was, uh, my finding is that the right to self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter relates to collective self-defense of states. It doesn't have anything to do with individual self-defense. And while um, self-defense is important, it's a, a principle that basically um, exonerates someone from uh, from responsibility for uh, violations of the right to life or other uh, violations, um, uh, but it is not itself an independent uh, and um, independent and universal right. And based on this, um, the the right to self defense does not ameliorate the duty of states to use due diligence in regulating civilian possessions in the ways that I identified previously. So my report concluded with a set of principles on the prevention of human rights violations committed with small arms and light weapons, which is essentially a reframing of a lot of principles that already existed in especially in the in the criminal justice area, because my study covered not just civilian possession, but also um, state 
violations and transfer. Um, but on the question of civilian possession, I wanted to point out um, principle 10, uh, which uh, establishes, um, which basically sets forth what state obligations would be to meet the due diligence requirements to prevent um, human rights violations committed through private possession of, of small arms. And basically they are these to establish licensing requirements um, to authorize possession for specific purposes only, to restrict use strictly for the purpose for which they are authorized, to require training in the proper use of small arms, including training on necessity and proportionality, to consider um, in licensing these factors, which came up in the, in, uh, in the collective practice of states, um, age, mental fitness, requested purpose, cr prior criminal record, and prior acts of domestic violence, and would require a periodic renewal of licenses. This is not a license that lasts forever. So let me very briefly, I know I'm probably going over time, so I just wanted to say that since in the past, it passed 14 years since I completed my study, um, the United uh, Nations has, uh, has taken other steps um, and the, this, discu this discussion on civilian possession is, um, has gained considerable um, uh, support, especially in the Human Rights Council. This resolution was just recently adopted in September, um, which um, has among its uh, language, in its language that it calls upon states to do their utmost to take legislative, administrative, and other measures consistent with international law, and in particular human rights law and their constitutional frameworks um, to promote programs that are tailored to, a, to reduce um, uh, firearms related violence um, caused by the possession of, of firearms by private actors. Okay, so it's, this is over and above what state responsibilities are for their own actors. And, um, this is um, author. This resolution authorizes the third study on the issue of civilian possession in the past six years, and I can talk about what those studies look like in the Q and A. And then in the Human Rights Committee and other treaty bodies, there there is further. There's more and more discussion on state responsibilities regarding gun violence. So uh, um, since. 2012, sorry, that there have been about um, 15 different states uh, who uh, have been asked to produce information regarding um, the, the um, misuse of firearms in their states. So there is more and more scrutiny in the treaty bodies. Um, in the US case, there was excessive scrutiny because of our seri the seriousness of, our, um, of the issue for us. And this is the language of the Human Rights Committee that they asked for continued pursuit of legislation requiring background checks for all private firearms transfers and a review of the stand your ground laws which have proliferated um, throughout the country to remove far, far reaching um, implica impacts and ensure strict adherence to the principles of necessity and proportionality. So my three conclusions from um, my study of um, my own study, but also the work being done in the UN is that we're, we're still in the early stages of normative development on due, di due diligence and gun violence, but there's really um, uh, this concept has been de well developed in other fields and, and it is fully applicable. Um, there's a significant consensus beyond the US regarding the criteria for licensing and private possession. And the US is the outlier on this issue, which truly does affect the development of the norm. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Madeline, and happy to answer questions later. Thank you uh, very much, Barbara. I have to say your report from the subcommission really served as a foundational piece for the initiative at the Harris Institute. And I'm also really glad you addressed the importance of concluding observations and of the review process. For those who don't know, the United States is currently in the middle of its review process, Human Rights Council, that will take place in November, as well as at the Human Rights Committee. 
And they have both um, acknowledged that they would like answers from the US government on what they're doing for gun violence. Um, so with that, um, Eugenio, I will turn it over to you. I think you're still muted. Okay, sorry, I was sharing uh, my screen. Can can anybody can everybody see my screen now? I can see it. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, my name is uh, Eugenio Weigand. I want to thank the Madeline, Professor Leila, and Professor Frey for uh, sharing this panel with me for inviting me uh, to talk about gun violence in the United States. I am the Associate Director for Gun Violence Prevention at the Center for American Progress, where we focus uh, mainly on gun violence within the United States. But we also address uh, an issue that is often uh, not addressed within the gun violence prevention space in the United States, but unfortunately is getting more attention now. And that is the repercussions that US guns have abroad, particularly in Central America, uh, uh, Mexico and, and South America. So that's what my presentation is gonna talk more about that. Um, and to start, I, I wanna show this chart that shows that uh, here are the number of guns manufactured in the United States in red, and here's a percentage of households with, with, with guns in the United States. And then we, we, we see here that those lines sort of went together up until 2005, 2006, where they start breaking apart. Um, and it's interesting because during that time we saw, for example, the ban of, of assault, the, the removal of the assault weapons ban in 2004, uh, the United States passed PLACA law, which, which uh, pretty much made the gun industry and uh, gun dealers immune to lawsuits, among other things. We started to see that the production of guns in the United States rose dramatically. Um, and the percentage of households sort of remained, the percentage of households with guns sort of remained flat. Now there's a, there's a couple hypotheses for that. And I wanna address those really quickly. One is that, um, households now have multiple guns. And that is true. We do see that many households in the United States now, now own up to 25, 30 guns with, within their household. So it's true. Uh, however, I have some concerns with that hypothesis based on the available data. I need to make a disclaimer here that data around gun violence in the United States is very, very limited. So we often have to rely on what we can find on estimates from academics uh, from journalists that make fantastic reports. Um, I want to take the, the moment to thank them because it's based on that that we can get some uh, information and some pieces of the puzzle. So based on that, there is a survey conducted by, uh, by the faculty at Harvard that shows that the growth of US gun ownership from 1994 to 2015 grew around 70 million. But if you look at the growth in the production and imports of guns in the United States during that time, it's around 156 million. So there's also a discrepancy there that questions uh, that the sole explanation of that shift in production and percentage of household owners is exclusive to that multiple uh, gun ownership theory. So the other potential explanation that I wanna address here is that many of those guns are simply going abroad and being trafficked. Um, and there are basically a lot of uh, 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 reasons to, to suspect that, uh, that support that. Here, the first one is, the same line of gun production in the United States. And then you see homicides in Mexico below. The line is very similar. There's a correlation of almost 80 uh, between those two graphs. So it's, it's, it shows that they're, they're associated somehow. Now, uh, there's a lot of questions of whether uh, you know, that's just a coincidence or not. But I, I here, as you can see, there's a, a lot of reasons to believe that it's just more than a statistical coincidence. Uh, you see the percentages in this graph, you see the percentages of homicides in Mexico perpetrated with a gun in 2004. Uh, this is right before the banning of assault weapons, uh, the removal of the ban on assault weapons in the United States in 2004. Let me just, I don't know if people know about this, but the, uh, the United States banned the, the commercialization of assault weapons from 1994 to 2004. And then in 2004, uh, it didn't renew that ban, so it was it was removed in 2004. And after that, you they were able to commercialize and sell assault weapons within the United States. So in Mexico, you saw that homicides in 2004, only 25% were perpetrated with a gun. By 2017, that percentage rose to 66%. Uh, and now it, 
figures from 2017 and 18 show that that's close to closer to 70 percent. So that's also another indication that it, it's possible that the, the shift in gun production in the United States is linked to violence abroad, particularly in, in, in Mexico. I'm mostly going to address Mexico in this presentation, but um, I have to say that there's there's also many other countries that suffer from similar uh, uh, challenges. Um, also, the, 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 when you break down the production of guns in the United States during that period, we know that the main, the main drivers of the production have been high caliber pistols and rifles. Those are the ones that are increasing, the, rising the level of production in the United States within the last 15 years. Uh, those are the weapons of choice for criminal groups in Mexico and Central America. So again, there's another indication that, that, that the, the first graph that I showed you is more than just a, a statistical coincidence. And there's reasons to believe that many of the guns that are being produced in the United States actually end up abroad. Um, there's also the ATF reports. You know, you have the ATF reports that have constantly show that out of all the guns recovered in Mexico, uh, uh, all, all the crime guns, yeah, recovered in Mexico, 70%, about 70% uh, are traced back to the United States. And that has been consistent from 2009 to 2018. Um, you know, that, that, that number has been pretty much the same. It hasn't changed a lot. Um, there, is a, there is a question of whether the other 30% also originated in the United States because many of them are of undetermined origin. So that doesn't mean that only 70%, it's possible that even more than that. But the official figures from the ATF show that it's about 70%. Um, there's also academic research that basically shows that um, around 213,000 firearms were purchased annually in the United States from 2010 to 2012 to be trafficked to Mexico. That means um, that, uh, what is it, around, well, I can't do the math right now, but it's a lot of guns per, per, uh, per day <laughs> that are trafficked uh, from the United States to, to Mexico. Uh, another study that is that particularly addresses the removal of the assault weapons ban in the United States shows that after that ban, homicides in in and specifically gun homicides in Mexican municipalities that border Texas, Arizona, uh, and New Mexico saw significant rise on on gun homicides. What is very interesting about this article from uh, Duve Duve and Garcia Ponce is that they show that the municipalities bordering California didn't see that much of a shift or increase or a significant increase in gun homicides. And the reason that the author said is that California maintained its own state level uh, ban on assault weapons. So again, you have statistical, uh, we have reports from the ATF, we have statistical correlations, we have academic papers that show this. Um, and then there's, the, the, there's just simply the, the just looking at uh, 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 journalists and uh, 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 publishing their articles and their images here. You see, these are gun confiscation. On, the, on, on your left, you see uh, guns that were seized in, in the United States that were meant to be trafficked to Mexico. On the other side, you see guns that were seized in Mexico that were coming from the United States. So you see that these are actually AR-15s, sometimes AK-47s, again, the weapons of choice for criminal groups in Mexico and Central America. Uh, there's also simply by looking at ATF press releases uh, in, in recent years where they show that uh, uh, there have been attempts uh, to, to traffic guns to Mexico, that they were caught by the ATF. Uh, you see numerous of those examples as well. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is that when you start adding press releases, you start adding publications from journals on images, when you look at statistics, when you look at uh, uh, rare, but they are academic studies, you, you, it starts to make sense and start to think that uh, you know, gun, gun being produced in the United States, many of them end up outside, beyond our, our own borders. Uh, now, what's important here is the repercussion that this has had in these countries. I mean, this is just an image of what happened a year ago in the municipality, municipality of Villa Union in Coahuila, where unfortunately 22 people were killed in a shootout with uh, uh, with AR-15s. Um, this is the this is the this is where uh, the mayor of this is the office of the mayor of Villa Union. This is what it looks like. Uh, Barbara just spoke about intimidating, uh, you know, politicians and candidates. This is this is what it looks like 
uh, uh, in Mexico when somebody uses those types of uh, uh, assault weapons against them. Uh, we also saw the, the, the example in Sinaloa where they caught the son of El Chapo Guzman uh, again last year and immediately there was a response by the Sinaloa cartel and this is what they look like. Now in this particular image, it's a, it's a, it's a Barrett 15 rifle. These rifles are capable of taking down helicopters uh, and, and they're being recovered in Mexico. Uh, an analysis done by John Lindsay Poland from Stop US Arms to Mexico found that there was from 2010 to 2018, there was 554 fifth, type 15 rifles like this one. He was able to uh, ensure that at least 227 of those came from the, were produced in the United States. Some of them, again, had no, uh, uh, we, we, they were not able to determine the origin, which also suggests that potentially the, the number of those that could actually come from the United States are, are much higher. Um, <clears throat> and I mentioned earlier that, that it, it's, it's not only Mexico. Here are just brief examples of US guns being recovered in Brazil, US guns being recovered in Colombia, US guns being recovered in Chile, and, and in Central America. So you see a lot of examples of, of not just Mexico, but other countries suffering the similar uh, problem of US guns fueling violence. It's not that these countries don't have problems. They have many problems. In Mexico, there's impunity rates. There's corruption in these countries. I'm not saying that, we're not saying that it's just the US guns, but when you combine guns to domestic violence, when you combine guns to bullying, when you combine guns with hatred, when you combine guns with drug markets, with corruption, the levels of lethality increase significantly and the, and the perception of insecurity increases significantly. Um, also, just to, to, just to, quite, uh, to quote a couple uh, uh, numbers, from 2014 to 2019, more than 11,500 guns were recovered in Canada that originated in the United States. During that same period, 70,000 guns recovered in Mexico originated in the United States. More than 15,000 guns recovered in Central American countries originated in the United States, and more than 6,000 guns recovered in Caribbean countries originated in the United States. We're talking about a uh, six-year period, uh, and we're, we're having more than around uh, more than 95,000 guns uh, of US origin being used in the region. And those, again, those are guns that are recovered, uh, which means there are a lot more guns, uh, US guns being used in crimes uh, in these countries. Uh, so just to con concluding thoughts, um, when analyzing US gun violence and human rights, violations of human rights, uh, uh, the violations of human rights in other countries need to be considered. Uh, we need to know that, yes, the, gun, the, the, the problem of gun violence is violating a lot of human rights within the United States, but that's, that goes beyond. The pers it's, it's affected the, the right to life in Mexico and Central America and South American countries. It's affected the right to feel secure uh, within your countries. Because having said that, it's not just homicides that are rising. It's the use of guns and robberies. It's the use of guns and kidnappings. It's the use of guns and extortions. And it's proven that when, when somebody suffers from, a, from a, a gun related crime, even though the gun was never fired, it still has effects of a perception, feeling secure for several months, feeling vulnerable for several months. And that just adds up uh, uh, to the whole community. So we need to consider when we're talking about gun violence in the United States and human rights abuses, of course, we need to focus on the United States. It has a lot of repercussions but we need to focus on, on the impact that it has on human rights uh, abroad as well. Uh, like I said before, Mexico and other Latin American countries, they have to address their own internal factors that contribute to high levels of, of, of violence. Um, uh, but the role of US guns needs to be considered. The level of gun trafficking from the United States needs to be considered. And I wanna pause here and I, highl I highlight here legal gun exports as well, because that's another issue. There's a lot of guns being trafficked from the United States to Mexico, and they're being used by criminal groups. But at the same time, the United States also provides the military in Mexico to combat those uh, uh, the criminal groups. So you have an interesting arms race there. The problem is that the military and police officers in Mexico are also, they have also issues of corruption. They have also issues of collusion and also are linked to many uh, human rights violations.
Um, you know, the, the Yotinapa case comes to mind where 43 students disappeared, uh, where there was involvement of corrupt uh, security agencies there. And some of those guns uh, used by uh, legal security agencies originated in the United States. Uh, so the United States must recognize its responsibility um, uh, on, on, on the challenges uh, of, of gun-related violence in Latin America and other countries. Uh, also, when assessing the impact, positive or negative, of a U.S. gun policy, specifically, for example, the, the assault weapons ban that I've talked about uh, during across the whole presentation, we must address its, its, its international implications as well. When we advocate, for example, let's reinstate the assault weapons ban, uh, we use the, the examples of mass shootings, which are tragic in the United States. And, and when an assault weapons is used in a mass shooting in the United States, levels of lethality increase, the number of victims are actually impact increases. So that's a, that's a great argument. And it's solid by itself to, ban, uh, to, to make the case for banning an assault weapons. But let's add also the international component. And if you add that, the case becomes even stronger. Um, and, and there, are, aside banning assault weapons and high capacity magazines, there are, I think, other measures that the United States can, can do. Uh, that would reduce not only gun violence within the United States, but also gun trafficking. And I think the best example is also universal background checks. I know that Barbara uh, touched a little bit on that um, as well. Uh, but in many, in many states within the United States, you can easily buy a gun at a gun show or online with no questions asked. And that clearly affects gun trafficking within the United States, but it also affects uh, international markets as well. I think we also need to address the problem of the high levels of guns that are being stolen each year in this country. Uh, we did a study at Center for American Progress that shows that uh, a gun is being stolen every two minutes in, this, in the United States. Again, that affects the, interna the internal uh, market and the internal gun violence, but it, many of those guns are potentially also being brought abroad as well. Uh, and then the final one is make data available. We have to advocate for better data. Uh, uh, and, and I think, I think more than lack of capacity with the institution, this has, has to do with lack of political will because we know that the data exists. I know that uh, ATF data has, uh, for example, uh, the number of crime guns that are recovered in Mexico and Trace. They have that data broken down by state, by type of gun, but they cannot release it. And that, is, that has to do with legal uh, limitation. So it's not uh, institutional capacity. It has to do more with, I think, political will to do it. Uh, but I think this data, data is important, not, not just in international gun trafficking, but also within the United States. Among the top causes of death within this country, the top 30, gun violence is the least research of, of, of them all. So we need to do more research and compile more data uh, as well. So with that, um, I'll, I'll leave it for questions and answers, and I'll turn it back to Adeline. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenio. You know, there was a question that came through through the Q&A that asked whether we thought this was an issue that should really be discussed as an international law issue or whether states are entitled to address it as an internal matter. And I think what you shared really just highlights why this can't be just an internal discussion because what happens here isn't isolated. You know, it does cross borders and does have human rights effects abroad. Um, and it's also why something like the UN Arms Trade Treaty, which perhaps Professor Frey can discuss a little during the Q&A, uh, might be an important piece to this puzzle. Um, I also really appreciate you pointing out this last point about seeding this data. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that not only has the US failed to pass regulations to actually regulate firearm sellers and the purchasing of firearms, but they've, what they have done in the last 20, 30 years is pass a lot of regulations that, for example, bar the ATF from compiling records of gun sales into a centralized database. Um, the Trehart amendments restrict states and cities from actually accessing trace data that they could use to make more informed policies. So we've really put these roadblocks in place that really stop researchers and policymakers from, from doing more about this crisis. Um, so now um, I think we're really narrowing into the US. So I will turn it over to Leila Sadat who can um, discuss how the human rights uh, implications in the US play out under law. Thank you so much, Maddie. And I really, I, just listening to um, Barbara and Eugenio, I, I feel like I learned so much every time I hear you talk because you have been toiling in this vineyard for a lot longer than we have. And you have brought some really 
depth and historical perspective and global perspective to this problem. So I'm really honored to be on a panel with both of you because you really are um, your trailblazers in this area. And so uh, I know at the Harris Institute, we really appreciate learning from you as well as participating in this. And I'm also grateful to those uh, in the audience who chose to come learn about this problem. It's, it's a pretty tough problem uh, to address and um, it, it's not easy, but it's something actually that I think is particularly important. I hadn't thought until Professor Frey mentioned it about the impact on voting, right? about armed individuals showing up at polls or threats against governors or Gabby Giffords is kind of the poster child for people being shot, but not just Democrats, um, Scalise, Scalise, I think, the congressman who was shot as well. So this is really something infecting. It's like an illness infecting uh, the political process as well as other issues. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint. I'm going to try to go through it pretty quickly and talk a little bit about the sort of US legal framework and talk about the interaction between the US legal framework and the international framework. Okay, hopefully this will work. Yes, can you see my screen? Okay, awesome. I have to do this every day with my students and mostly I get it right. <laughs> All right, so if you think about gun violence and human rights, um, usually in the United States, we start our conversation with the Second Amendment. We didn't always start the conversation with the Second Amendment, right? The Heller case was decided only in 2008. Prior to that, for the entirety of US history, the Second Amendment was believed not to have conferred a, uh, in, an individual right to bear arms. That is, there was no individual right. It was really about a well-regulated militia. And you can see the text of the amendment there. Heller was applied to the states in 2010. And for a court that prides itself on originalism, this is a pretty extravagant interpretation, really, of a very, very new right that had never existed and really has no international parallel. So this has become a, a unique feature, if you like, of the U.S. constitutional framework. Heller was a 5-4 decision. But even after Heller, you can see that reasonable gun control laws are still constitutional. Justice Scalia, who authored the majority opinion, and in Heller said, of course, um, you know, the right is not unlimited. And uh, then Justice Kennedy uh, issued an important um, concurring opinion saying, of course, we have to look at certain limitations. With the potential appointment of a new justice um, who has just been voted out of committee, who um, supports, quote, Second Amendment rights, I think we're likely to see Heller, which was, again, narrowly adopted, deeply enshrined in US constitutional jurisprudence, and thousands of challenges against gun laws are brought by the NRA, which challenges uh, the right of, of states to regulate gun violence at all, as well as the federal government. Um, that said, uh, the Second Amendment, as it stands now, um, doesn't pose uh, a constitutional obstacle to the regulation of firearms in the United States, and 90% of the challenges since the Heller case have actually been um, dismissed. Uh, at the same time, we have had a lot of legislative weakening of the framework that governs U.S. gun control laws. Um, the T. Hart Amendment that Maddie just mentioned, which bans uh, basically gathering of data. The Dickey Amendment does the same thing with respect to the CDC. The assault weapons ban was allowed to expired. Um, there's a new reciprocal concealed carry bill that would basically loosen all ability of states to um, regulate gun control with the change in, in uh, leader change in, in the House. I think that's not going to go forward, but it was uh, legislation that was adopted by the House early in the Trump administration that basically said any state can loosen its gun laws and all the other states then have to respect that. That is, if you have concealed carry in one state, that concealed carry can be ported over to another state. And what's um, surprising in our own state, I live in Missouri, my adopted state, I'm not from here, but I've been here a long time, is um, when Missouri repealed its 1921 permit to purchase handgun law, which by the way, um, the, the citizens of the state had both 
voted to keep it, and it was the legislature that had then overturned a citizen referendum, um, we saw a spike of 25% increase in gun homicide risk uh, rates in the state. And the other problem, and I don't have time to talk about this this morning, uh, about 60% of all the gun, case, gun deaths in the United States are suicide. So it's homicide, but it's also suicide, which is 85% more likely to be successful if a firearm is involved. And the irony in the United States is we see after mass shootings, two thirds of the gun laws that are introduced actually relax the gun laws. They don't tighten the gun laws. So there's a peculiar psychology. You know, we can talk about law all we want, but we clearly have a culture cultural and psychological issue in the United States where we have these kind of perverse responses to violence, which becomes increasingly normalized in our society. If you look globally, as you've heard from um, Dr. Frey and Eugenio already, the United States is a global uh, outlier. This is an old chart from 2013. I think it's even worse now. Um, and we also see that the United States appears to be unique in that when we do have a horrific mass shooting, uh, instead of tightening our laws, we loosen our laws. So think about what happened in New Zealand with the Christchurch shooting. There was an immediate reaction to tighten New Zealand gun laws. Australia experienced the same thing. Uh, the UK experienced the same thing. And then their gun violence um, fatalities go down to basically zero. In the United States, we've seen the same pattern. States that restrict guns, that have universal background checks, that have um, reasonable gun control regulations, right? It's not impossible, but their restrictions and limitations have fewer deaths than states that don't. And my own state of Missouri is not doing very well of, uh, on this chart, which is uh, particularly alarming. And St. Louis, in fact, had one of its bloodiest summers ever this past summer. Um, and, and so what we are doing at our institute is not just working on the legal framework, that's our job, but the public health crisis that it's creating is enormous, uh, as others have mentioned. Um, if you just think of, can the United States do this, right? It's sort of like seatbelt laws, right? It's about safety in motor vehicles. Yes, of course, the United States can do this. Um, it just has chosen not to. And I think that is part of the difficulty we're looking at. So the question, and this is really wonderful that we had the question in the chat, is can international law help? And here I really am looking at it inside the United States. Eugenio is correct that we have a global problem and the US manufacturing is uh, aggravating the global problem. Um, but I think we are looking at it in our institute, the way so many uh, other intractable problems are happening um, in the United States that you have to think about the international legal framework because American exceptionalism, I think, is literally killing us. Um, so if you think about treaties and customary international law in the United States, I don't need to tell this audience, except maybe there are a lot of international students here, so I'll go through some of the law, right? Treaties are the supreme law of the land. I know that surprises even my international law students sometime. It's in Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution, and way before even the Paquete Havana, but the Paquete Havana is sort of one of the most famous and iconic cases that talks about customary international law is part of U.S. law, right? So these are two well-entrenched constitutional federal ideas about uh, treaties and custom in the United States. The U.S. has ratified a lot of international treaties, including the U.N. Charter, the OAS Charter, um, the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the International Covenant on, Economic, uh, on Civil and Political Rights, um, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Human and Degrading Treatment, and the Constitution of the WHO. And those treaties then provide very specific tools, whether it's through the treaty bodies or universal periodic review through the Human Rights Council, um, where the United States legal system and the United States practices have to interact with the global community within the framework of these international uh, treaty bodies or within the UN or the WHO itself. That said, there are a lot of treaties we haven't ratified. So here we have American exceptionalism at work, the UN Convention on the Rights of the trial Child. I think we are now the only outlier. Um, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the Women's Convention, and very importantly, uh, relating to Eugenio and Barbara's presentation, the, the really important trafficking, right? The Small Arms Trade, the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, and the Inter-American Convention. And these are really important treaties that the U.S. is not a party to. 
Uh, this is a picture of one of my favorite UN officials, Prince Zaid uh, of Jordan, who was High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. He also was very active in many other UN endeavors. But he, when he was High Commissioner for Human Rights, sort of fast forwarding from the, the, the sort of more modest beginnings of 2001, 2002 that Professor Frey has explored already, he really said, look, you cannot keep having mass killings in the United States consistent with your obligations under human rights law. And I think he was very clear and very vocal about that in his um, advocacy for bringing the U.S. sort of more into compliance with the human rights framework. I won't go through all of these things. Um, we have a big white paper on this. Um, maybe somebody could type it into the chat, Maddie. There's a huge white paper now that, that kind of summarizes a lot of this. Starting from the 2006 UN Subcommission Report, Human Rights Council reports, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, because domestic violence against women is aggravated by uh, the presence of guns. Human Rights Committee has looked at the right to life discrimination. African American populations in the United States and people of color are deeply affected by the presence of guns in the United States. Um, stand your ground laws and other kinds of um, legislation that allow sort of more free sort of self-defense often have a very discriminatory impact as honestly has the use of guns by police in the United States. And so the human rights bodies have also focused on shootings and specifically police shootings of people of color. CERD has weighed in on that. The Committee Against Torture um, has not, it, it has weighed in on gun violence. Uh, I think actually more could be done with that because I think particularly in the school shooting case, and here I'm indebted to Christina Serna, um, who is uh, the head of one of ILA's committees on human rights, um, for really pointing out that, you know, when you have these mass school shootings so often, the kids are in the custody of the state, right? And so the failure to protect, and not just the failure to protect the children, but then to impose upon all school children in public schools, things like active shooter drills and clear plastic backpacks and armed guards patrolling the school has created a generation of school kids who are completely psychologically traumatized. And one of the things that we're looking at in our research is, is that level of psychological tra trauma actually tantamount to ill treatment under the torture convention. I, I think a good argument can be made that it is. Um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has been starting to take a deep dive into these issues. And uh, they have uh, had um, calls to the United States to improve its human rights practice and actually have had two um, hearings. And here you can see Eugenio in both of them <laughs> looking very tall um, and Maddie George uh, attending one of them as well. And we're really very grateful to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which has taken this issue quite seriously. Now, my law students always say to me like, well, so what, right? You went to, you know, wherever you went and you talked to people in Bogota or in Quito or even in Washington, DC, and how are you gonna actually get this into law? Because that's what we teach in law students. Um, I'm gonna skip the WHO. So Roper versus Simmons is a case that I like to point to as at least a little bit of uh, international law infusing the US legal system. And these are obligations embodied in treaties and customary international law, right? And we've said that these elements, the both treaties and custom are part of US law where they're enforced. Um, there have been many justices of the US Supreme Court, not lately and not probably many among the 6-3 uh, court that we're likely to get after the I assume, assured confirmation of uh, Amy Coney Barrett. Um, but there have, as recently as Roper versus Simmons, been justices very, very willing to look at international sources. And remember that international law trickles into the United States Supreme Court, not just through the human rights cases, right, but through garden variety cases about immunity, about banking, about aircraft liability, about lots and lots and lots of things. So um, even though you had a very strong pushback from um, now 
the, the late Justice Scalia, there are many justices, including Justice Breyer, who's still on the court, Sotomayor, who have seen the United States as taking its place in the community of nations and have been very accepting of international and, um, and, and comparative law. Now, there are a lot of barriers, right? One is sovereign immunity, the political question doctrine, the non-self-executing doctrine in Medellin versus Texas, US reservations and declarations to human rights treaties. And quite honestly, the Federalist Society has made um, deactivating the role of international law in US courts part of its platform. And we know that the Federalist Society um, vets judges that are now appointed to the court, or at least that's what's been reported to the news. So that's a problem. We also have this cultural problem, right, that comes out of, um, again, relatively recent Supreme Court cases, but it's been there for a while. DeShaney and then the Castle Rock case, where you have the US Supreme Court arguing that states don't have active obligations or the US government doesn't have an active obligation to protect under substantive due process, life, liberty and property of its citizens against invasion by private actors. That's the flip side. Human rights law says exactly the opposite, right? Human rights law argues that states have obligations of due diligence, not just with respect to their own actions, but with respect to protecting their citizens from actions by private actors. And this clearly doesn't apply on its face to the resolution of a human rights issue, right? The treaties stand alone. But I would say it's a cultural and sort of deep sociological impediment now in the thinking of many American lawyers that see sort of negative rights as the only thing protected by the, the US Constitution and Bill of Rights or even state constitutions, as opposed to the positive rights in the human rights system where governments have a duty really to take care. And I think um, ex exploring sort of some of that, we're hearing it play out even in the presidential campaign, right? Where you have one candidate saying there's a right to health. You have the other candidate saying there's no right to health, right? A lot of the economic, social, and cultural rights, a lot of the obligations imposed by the global human rights system or adopted or um, embraced by the global human rights systems are, uh, are rights that at least a percentage a percentage. I don't think popular opinion, it's a majority, but I think certainly among legal elites, there is a tendency to see those as sort of not applicable in the United States, again, because of this American exceptionalism. We're different. Um, now, what's interesting, again, thinking about what can be the interplay between the international and the national systems, and I realize I'm going out of time, is the in the Jessica Gonzalez case, which was dismissed in the Castle Rock case, actually the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights found the US government had failed to protect her rights. Um, I'm gonna skip all this. Obviously, grassroots advocacy, education is critically important. And remember, human rights begins at home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Layla. And I'm really glad you were able to touch on some of this positive versus negative, negative rights dichotomy. I'm very cognizant of the fact that we are um, running out of time, maybe a little over. Hopefully they won't kick us out. Barb and Eugenio, I wanna give you just a quick chance to respond, give final thoughts if you would like to. Sure, um, yeah, this has been a great panel. I There was a question that just came in about is it really effective or what could be an effective use of the international mechanisms on the US case? And I, you know, the US, as Layla has pointed out, is, does have this exceptionalist stance, but I often um, just remind people about the role of the UN as an alternative place for having discussions and gathering data and information that, you know, we think of this more in really repressive environments um, where it's dangerous to, to try to hold hearings, uh, you know, uh, but it, the UN can receive information from civil society and they can create an alternative, um, uh, you know, alternative form of truth. It's not alternative truth. It is the truth, a place where the truth can be spoken about these things that, that the rest of the world agrees upon. And I think that um, th that is a role that civil society needs to continue to take advantage of and to try any opportunity, any opening that we can to have an impact. 
um, the, the UN, because the US has ratified these treaties, has certainly the authority to ask for information, to ask for the kind of data that Eugenio is pointing out that the United States is, is keeping away from its own uh, citizens. And that, and that opens up also different angles for pointing out the impacts of this issue. So it's the, the denial of information to the American public. It's um, you know, approaching things on um, freedom of religion and, uh, uh, and conscience. Um, it also, it, we also recognize that the you know, United States political environment shifts. And so it was quite stunning during the Democratic debates that not just Joe Biden, who ultimately won, but every single one of all those candidates up on stage um, talked about um, the need for, um, for protection against gun violence and the need to take steps. And that indicates a shift in the, you know, that um, regardless of what happens in this election, the majority, that, that the Democratic Party feels like it, it has the political um, uh, support of the majority to be able to make those claims. And then just a couple um, kind of left field ideas for people who are, um, creative in, in human rights litigation. One is, is re really making claims for reparations for victims um, for because of the United States' um, uh, failure to use due diligence. And so victims of mass shootings, I don't see why they couldn't go to the, the UN and, and, and start to make demands for reparations. We have um, these ridiculous barriers to civil litigation in the United States that take away all the liability of gun manufacturers, but you know that doesn't mean that we can't use some of these fora for people to make claims against the government and its failure to protect them. And then um, the other arises out of Eugenio's rep, uh, presentation, and I'm sure this has been discussed by states but the, who are somewhat fearful of the United States but you we could they could bring other governments could bring um, complaints against the United States in international fora for the the uh, you know kind of damage that's being inflicted by uh, by that transfer of these weapons thanks those are some fantastic final thoughts and really it has the wheels turning in my head of where we can go with this initiative over the next few years um, Eugenio, I'll give you the final remark. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I agree with pretty much everything that Barbara just said. Um, I, I, I think that using the UN resolutions or reports from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, you, having US civil society use that politically and say, these are international organizations that are saying this and our governor, not, not only is our government not listening to us because many, of the regulations that I talked about are supported by more than 90% of the US population. So not only, so it can be the case, you can make a case, I'm thinking about uh, uh, an, an article on some newspaper that talks about that, written by civil society organization. Listen, the government's not only not listening to us, but now we have the UN resolutions, we have recommendations from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and they're not, they're not listening to them as well. So that could have sort of a, a, a political impact, which I agree with, with Barbara. The support for uh, gun regulation and changes has been increasing. Uh, we did not see a debate, a 2008 debate, talk about gun violence. We did now, and at, the, at least at the Democratic level, and also among the, the presidential candidates. Uh, so there, there has been some movements in that direction, which are positive. And I, I definitely think that uh, recommendations from the United Nations or the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights would help that push, push that a little bit further. Um, I absolutely agree with Barbara uh, that there should be compensation to victims, not only to those, I, I would just only add that not only to those that have been physically impacted by gun violence, but also mentally impacted through uh, gun, gun robbery, uh, robberies involving guns, uh, um, uh, witnessing a crime, etc. It just goes beyond physical trauma. Uh, I guess that's what I'm, I, I want to say. I also really like what Barbara said about self-defense not being a, a, a right, a human right, um, because that's the idea that the U.S. gun industry is trying to sell in other countries, in Mexico, in Brazil. They're used. They're selling that idea. There's violence uh, driven by criminal groups. There's violence even involving the government. You need to arm yourself. You need to arm yourself as civilian. 
that's your right. And I like that Barbara highlighted that that's not a human right. Um, and I think countries that were uh, advocates in those countries could use that, uh, uh, that, that, that fact. Um, so th anyway, those were my final thoughts uh, as, as I was listening to Barbara and, 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 and Lida speak. Well, well, thank you all to um, all of our panelists and all of our attendees for staying on with us a little extra. I mean, I could go on and talk for another hour with these fantastic people. Um, really great insights on this issue. I think it's given us a lot to think about. And personally, I think it's given us a little hope that maybe international law can provide one piece to help managing this crisis. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of International Law Weekend. I'd ask you, um, encourage you to please check out the new keynote by Ms. Catherine Amifer. There's also some great networking receptions today. And then tonight, I hope you join us at International Law Trivia. And thank you very much for joining today. Have a good day. Thank you so much.